You were born in Rio de Janeiro. Indeed. How did that happen to take place? You want the long answer? Sure. The long answer is that um, during the 20s, um, the Im immigration laws uh, had quotas on, uh, uh, on immigration uh, from Eastern Europe. So many Jews from Eastern Europe, like my father and his family, uh, would go to South America, to, uh, to Brazil and to Puerto Rico, Cuba, and establish residency there. Uh, so in the 20s, uh, my father brought his whole family over from Poland. They established themselves there and they stayed there. Uh, and then he established a business uh, there and uh, required him to travel back and forth. And we lived in Brazil. Uh, my parents lived in Brazil during uh, the, the late 30s, early 40s. And so I was born there. And he was in the import-export business? My father did. I never was sure. My father, the closest I can come is my father did what Sidney Greenstreet did in the Maltese Falcon. You know, it had to do with ships coming in at night and things being offloaded and then they would be sold. I mean, it, it was all, I'm sure, legal, but it was a sort of mysterious. Import-export, yeah. essentially. Like James Bond. <laughs> oh, well, no. More like Sidney Greenstreet in a, in a black and white film, in a B-movie. He gads her. Yeah. And your mother? Uh, where My was mother, she? Pauline, uh, was born on Essex Street in New York, and uh, they met uh, in the Jewish mountains. My father uh, then played the mandolin, followed her around, uh, and uh, won her heart, inexplicably. And how old were you when the family came to the States? I was three years old. We came in uh, 1943. So during the war? Yeah. Yeah. They smuggled me on, on board this, this ship. I had... Uh, I had um, Scarlet fever. I had some childhood thing, and uh, they they uh, wrapped me up and put me in a basket, I guess, and uh, smuggled me into a, uh, to the United States. Was that considered a dangerous trip at that point? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, no, because th there weren't too many U-boats around Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know, so I can make up a story. They were in the Caribbean. I, I, yeah, they were. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. and in Amagansett, as mm -hmm. we know. Right. Right. <laughs> No, we made it. We made it. And you grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn? Yes. Or as we preferred to call it, East Midwood, but it was really Flatbush. Uh, yeah, we lived in Flatbush uh, in a couple of houses. I went to local high schools and grammar schools, PS 197, PS 222. Back then when the public education system in New York was pretty damn good, actually. Yeah. Which high school? Uh, Bronx, no, no, I tell a lie. Um, I went to uh, Brooklyn Technical High School. Hmm. And you were a red diaper baby? I was a red, oh yeah, was I ever. Yeah. Howard Fast spoke at my house. Um, Paul Robeson sang at my house to raise money. Um, my parents were not card-carrying members of the Communist Party because um, they felt they would be more effective uh, uh, just as what they called fellow travelers. Was there a lot of, of um, music in the house at that point? Yeah, a lot of music. Mm -hmm. uh, there was folk music. Uh, my mother was a pianist. Uh, my sister was a pianist. Uh, my parents kept trying to come up with an instrument that I would play, and, uh, and it turned out at one point to be the accordion, which is probably the most loathsome of all, of all instruments. And I played the accordion for a while. Use and the then, accordion, go to jail, I think, with Steve Allen's <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, right. Uh, and then uh, when, when uh, I was old enough to uh, start going into what we call the city, which mm -hmm. was Manhattan, we, uh, I used to go to um, uh, Washington Square on Sunday afternoons where they had these big open uh, folk sessions, and I, I, I picked up the banjo and the guitar and the mandolin and, and all that. Was it around that same time that you, you thought about writing? Were you thinking at all about being a writer at that point? Or no. totally music? I don't know what I was, th I do, that, that question contains an assumption that I was thinking. <laughs> uh, I was uh, living day to day, um, uh, trying to make myself attractive to the, the, the prettiest girls in the class. Uh, um, but no, it was only later when, when I, I, I was in college um, that I was, uh, became interested in writing because uh, I was starting to read a little bit and uh, people like S.J. Perlman and, and Benchley and, uh, you know, and also the more, you know, legitimate, uh, if that's the word, uh, authors. But um, the first thing I ever wrote uh, that I can remember is, is um, w w uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, was a land-grant college, which meant you had to have um, a, uh, uh, you had to go for two years to, uh, 
uh, ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps, for your freshman and, and your sophomore year, where you'd go and put on a uniform and you'd march around, uh, you know, the football stadium. And uh, every year they'd have a military ball. And uh, the, the uh, you know, the left-wing group on campus would have an anti-military ball, and, and uh, we would have uh, sketches and things like that. So I, uh, the, the first writing I ever did was highly political. It was... Uh, and satirical. Uh, I, I hope, yeah. I don't I, I, I shudder to think what it was, but yeah, yeah little sketches and things like that. Were you, a, were you a movie fan growing up? Were you a fan of, of movies? And yeah. I mean, it, we weren't the kind of movie fan where my mother would take me to see whatever MGM musical was playing that week. But, um, um, you know, a lot of it came out of the, the, the political position of my parents. In other words, I, I think the first movie I ever saw was of a Soviet film called The Cranes Are Flying. For 25, 26 cents, you could go to the Elm Theater on, uh, on Avenue M and you could see two features and a... Uh, and a, a bunch of cartoons and uh, and, uh, and a, um, a Captain Video serial, so uh, I, I was not an avid um, film, you know, buff. But uh, when I got older, uh, and we still had the independent art houses, I, I became entranced with with that whole wonderful group of, uh, uh, of European filmmakers, you know, Tr Truffaut and and Godard and, and, and the Italians. And uh, so we would go to the Jewel or to the Kent, uh, who were the art houses. I don't think there were any of them left. I started out as a physics major with the idea of uh, taking a Bachelor of Science uh, on the way to being a doctor. Uh, about halfway through, I realized I didn't want to do that. And so I switched to a music major on my way to becoming a patient. And. Um, uh, so I wound up, uh, I was actually uh, suspended from the University of Wisconsin for a semester for um, failing my um, final exam in ROTC. And the reason I failed was that uh, the, it was an essay question and uh, the question said, uh, explain why it's important for the United States to have military bases all over the world. So I did what I was told was legitimate, which was to challenge the question. And I said, on the contrary, it is not important. We should not, you know, we should look to our own. And I got an F. Um, and uh, the only clout that the ROTC group had was that if you got an F and you had missed more than three drill sessions, they were entitled to require that the, that the, um, that the punishment be that you be suspended for a semester. So I had the, actually, I'm proud to say, I had the highest grade point of anybody who was ever suspended from the University of Wisconsin for a semester for uh, political reasons. I worked at Wisconsin General Hospital as an assistant to the pathologist and that's what cured me of ever wanting to be a doctor. I did steal, however, a lot of linen from my friends. My roommate and I, uh, Eric Weisberg, who later went on to be a, a fairly well-known uh, musician and instrumentalist and, and all that, and uh, he and I did the Deliverance album uh, yeah. that, that eventually became the, the Deliverance album. Um, we would play Saturday nights at the local bar, you know, but mainly it was just uh, uh, it was just for our own amusement. Uh, our, our our apartment was kind of a a, a magnet for for um, the folk music uh, scene in Madison. In fact, when uh, Bob Zimmerman came through Madison on his way from Hibbing, Minnesota, on his way to New York to become Bob Dylan and be bigger than Elvis, uh, he stayed at our apartment. And um, he came in a suit and a thin tie, and he didn't play the guitar, he played the piano. Did he steal any of your records? He was no. Sort of a... <laughs> no. No, he was a perfectly quiet uh, young man. Did, now, did the Terriers already exist, or did... They, oh, they pre existed yes. The Terriers um, uh, originally were um, um, uh, Bob, Eric Darling, um, Alan Arkin, and Bob Carey. And they had a hit roughly around the time I was in college called The Banana Boat Song, and an, another, another couple of hits. And then, you know, the Terriers were like the ink spots. You know, the name remained the same, but people went through it, you mm -hmm. know, like a car wash, and they mm -hmm. were replaced. So um, when I got out of Wisconsin, um, Eric, who had already left uh, and had joined them, uh, asked me if I would like to join. And, you know, I, you know I, my kids, I keep, I keep telling my kids that my life is no, no example of how to plan a life.
you know, back then they would, I, either they weren't or I didn't feel that kind of, that anxious making pressure of, 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 of financial security, success. Um, Even know, getting into college was not the trauma that it is It now. was nothing. I, my parents said, you know, they were clueless anyway, but, you know, where do you want to go? I said, well, my friend Ronnie uh, is, is, is going to Wisconsin. He was a year ahead of me, so maybe I should go there, you know. I, um, you know, I, I, w I applied to some other places. I was accepted, I think, at Harvard uh, on some kind of deferred thing, and I didn't want to go because it was Harvard. It was like establishment. I mean, it's hard to recreate that mindset now, but, but um, I wouldn't have been caught dead. At, a, at an Ivy League college. I wanted to go to a populist college where they had banjo playing. I think people don't realize, I mean, people think of Bob Dylan, certainly, and maybe King Century, or Peter Paul and Mary, don't realize what a phenomenon folk music was in the early 60s. And, I mean, Hootenanny. Hootenanny was a, was a television show, which we were on, yeah. Yeah, it was a big, it was a big movement, uh, uh, quite discreet and distinct from uh, the early rock and roll stuff. I left the Tarriers, and then I met John Phillips, and that's a whole other opera of my involvement with, with John and Michelle Phillips, which lasted roughly for nine months. And how I escaped that burning building is a mystery to me, but I, but I, <laughs> but I did. He was with the old journeyman. And then they broke up for some reason, because that's what happens. It's like amoeba, you know, they just split off. And, and he had met Michelle, who was a knockout, and um, he wanted to put together a, a group. It's going to call the New Journeyman. And what, did I want to join? And I, sure, why not? I didn't have an offer from Goldman Sachs. So I said yes. And then uh, the, thence came the roller coaster. You were with them, with the Manson. Murders happened. Right? <laughs> yes, I had a ticket to the Manson murders. <laughs> no, that was when I was I was already working yeah. in television. Right, I was, was working for later. for the Tonight Show. I was the head writer for Carson, and on one of our many trips out to Los Angeles, uh, this would have been '69. Uh, um, um, uh, we almost went that night to, to up to uh, Benedict Canyon to to um, Terry Melcher. Terry Melcher's house. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that um, um, Polanski was renting. I guess he was over in London. Anyway, everybody knows the story. And I, I actually, as a writer, um, I was always looking for material for Carson. And I had read that day that there was a, this will show you what kind of a nerd I was, uh, there was a, a, a giant colony of phosphorescent plankton that had drifted in off Malibu Beach, and that every time uh, the wave crashed. It, 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 it lit up like a, uh, you know, a fluorescent light, and I wanted to go see that. So when John called and said, uh, "We're invited out to Malibu for some kind of a party tonight," because I used to, I, 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 I led a schizophrenic life. During the day, I go to Burbank and I write my jokes and my sketches for Johnny, and then at night, I would look for something more interesting and I drive down Sunset Boulevard and the, the night blooming jasmine you know would make you very heady and I'd go over to John and Michelle's house in Bel Air and uh, I'd say well what have you got for me tonight you know I'm, you know I'm, I'm um, you, know, you know an anthropologist I want, I want to see your life and he said that night which was a Friday night um, he said, well, we can go to Michael Sarn's place on, in Malibu in the colony. He's a director friend of theirs. They can have some people. Or we could go uh, to see uh, Sharon and her friends up in uh, Benedict Canyon. And I said, well, I've got to go to the beach because I've got to see these phosphorescent plankton. So that's, that's why I'm here. Hmm. How did you make the transition from music to writing? What, what, what exactly took place? Well, when I, was, when I joined the Tarriers, one of the reasons they asked me to join was because they needed somebody to front the group and talk while everybody was tuning up. You know, there was always a guy who yeah. did the talking. You know, there was, there was um, the guy in the limelighters, I forgot his name, who played the bass, and he would do the talking. And so I started to, um, you know, develop little, little uh, jokes and routines and stuff like that. I'm, not, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to coordinate this with the meeting of Woody. You know, Woody was our opening act 
at the boot at the bitter end mm -hmm. back in 65 or something like that 60 something and I think at that time we were already sort of writing together because uh, we had the same management office the legendary Jack Rollins uh, office uh, and, and Charlie Jaffe who was his partner um, obviously heard some of the stuff that I was writing and said to Woody you know maybe you two guys should you know, right together, and because he was he was now coming up, he he was getting gigs, you know, on television and uh, the occasional special, and uh, so he needed a lot of material, and that's so. So I was I was writing then. I was kind of pulled into it. Uh, it's important to be lucky, you know. So I, I just happened to be at the at the right place at the right time. So that was all kind of going on at the same time. I was working with Woody during the daytime, and then at night uh, I was sort of uh, fronting uh, the Tarriers. And how did that? lead to Candid Camera? Well, I wanted to, you know, I, I was walking down 57th Street uh, between uh, 6th and 7th Avenues, and on the south side of the street there used to be, and may still be, a, um, a mirror between two, two stores, and the mirror was slightly um, um, wavy, and it, it was like one of those corny house mirrors that makes you very distorted. And I remember carrying, because I used to do a lot of uh, studio work, you know, because there was the folk music craze and everybody wanted the folk sound, you know, the beer commercials and this and that. And so uh, Eric and I actually made it, you know, a nice living going from studio to studio, playing the banjo, because I had a background in music because I switched my music. Uh, I switched to music out of medicine. Uh, so I, you know, I, I could read charts and um, so for, you know, a couple of years there, people like me were kind of valuable to the to the commercial industry. I was walking down 57th Street carrying a banjo and a guitar and a mandolin um, and I looked at myself and I thought, and I looked really weird and distorted and I said, is this what my father, you know, escaped Poland to, to have me do? No, I don't want to do this anymore. And I dropped it. And uh, I wanted to, um, I wanted to write and the easiest thing at that time was a candid camera because Alan Funt, um, being somewhat shall I say, eccentric, um, uh, people, uh, there's always jobs available at Candid Camera. And uh, I, I, I applied for a job there and uh, I wrote a list of, you know, humiliating little, you know, scenarios. It was the first reality show, really. We should probably explain what it was, because it started out on radio, right, wasn't it? Candid Microphone. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alan Funt was a guy who had the idea that uh, he would like to trap people in, in uh, uh, unsuspecting and strange situations. Um, and it started out, as you say, as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a radio show, although I can't imagine how it worked on the radio. But on television, you know, he'd, he'd, put, a, he'd put a speaker inside of a, of, a, of a mailbox and then people would open the thing and then the speaker, you know, the mailbox would talk and say, don't put that in there, I don't, you know, whatever. And then there'd be a camera hidden somewhere and they, they, they'd catch the people's reaction. And uh, um, I think it's available, it must be available on YouTube or something like that. Some of them were absolutely hilarious, uh, but ultimately uh, very hostile. You know, like him, I gather. I mean, I gather he was. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm under uh, an oath not to talk about what I know about Alan, Alan Fund because he's dead. But yes, he was a prick. I shared an office with Fanny Flagg and Joan Rivers, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, it was in strange. It was over on, e on West 55th Street, off 6th Avenue, upstairs uh, in this building, and he had uh, like a bays, editing bays, because they shot a lot of film. But he, he, um, he had a camera, a little security camera in each bay, watching each person work. And then he had a, a, you know, a bank of, of monitors in his office. It was all about, you know, voyeurism. I even remember he had installed, he had a fish tank there. So he could watch the fish, or he could watch the editors, he could watch the writers. Everything was, was uh, it was like the, uh, you know, like the, the Stasi. How long were you there? Oh, three months. Sounds like you had a record, record career span there. I had a long career. Yeah. A long career. And then from he, there you went to The Tonight Show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My friend Cavett uh, was um, writing for Johnny. 
And, and how did you two meet? How did you and Catherine meet? Uh, he was also um, a client of the Rollins office, and he was a friend of Woody's, and um, I was introduced to him as this young guy with a beard, a full beard. He was a writer. He had come off Time Magazine as a, as a something, I don't know what he did at Time Magazine. And um, he worked for Parr, and then when Parr left, um, uh, Carson inherited the writing staff, and he was just beginning to, to leave. Um, to think about leaving and going out and following Woody and Woody's footsteps of going and you know playing the clubs and trying to get a career. So I asked him um, to. I said, "How do you, how does it work?" At the here's a tip to young aspiring people who want to work for Johnny Carson. Um, I, I I reasoned that if I submitted a bunch of jokes to Johnny in exactly the same format that he was used to receiving it every day, he would be inclined to think that I already worked for him. Uh, and this was back in the days, in the last century, of, um, of uh, type uh, sets, of uh, uh, carbon sets, they were called. You had a... Oh, I remember. I used to... Yeah. A white top and then canary copy and sets. then blue and copy sets, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, uh, and then there, there, was a, there was an opener that said, yes, you know, you, you love me now, but will you call me in the city, you know. And then there were three jokes on that page separated by wide margins, and then on the second page there were three more, and then you usually typed like between three and a half and four pages of jokes. He had about five or six writers. He'd select his monologue from that. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, and he hired me. I'm not saying that's the only reason the jokes were funny, but it's, it's not bad to uh, give yourself an edge. You became head writer really quickly. Almost instantly. Mm -hmm. Walter Kempley, who was the head writer then, an older man of like 38, um, with four children, uh, had a, a quarrel, a disagreement with the producer about a $17 raise for the next cycle. And the producer held the line. And uh, when I was first hired, I didn't even have an office. I had an old um, um, Smith Corona office machine on a little typewriter stand that you could roll around and I would find either an empty office or I'd go out in the hall or I'd go you know, into, the, uh, into the fire stairs and I'd type my jokes. And one day, Walter called me into his office and he said, you are now the head writer. I'm going to California where they hand you the money as you get off the plane. And here is my joke file and here is my box of Macanudo cigars, which was de rigueur if you were going to be the head writer. And I said, but I don't, he said, you'll be fine. Now, I, I, I realized soon after that nobody wanted the job of the head writer because the monologue writers were, had it great. Of course, they had to be good. You could come in almost any time you like. If you submitted the jokes and Johnny did them, you were fine. But the head writer had to do a shitload of stuff. You had to write those what we called five spots, the, 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 the Aunt Blabbies and the Carnax and the this and the that and the sketches and the, the tea time movies and, and you had a, and, you know, people would send in funny, you know, inventions and you'd have to, you know, it was a lot of work. It was great. It was absolutely great. But I didn't know enough not to want to do it. Um, yeah, I was paid $320 a week and then gradually it went up to, um, at that time, I think I was earning maybe two thousand dollars a week. You were twenty-seven. Yeah. Amazing. What was the Carnac saver? That was my invention. That's my contribution to the culture. When a joke bombs, you wanna, you wanna. We'd, we'd give him a list of funny things to say. You know, may the may the great you know sphinx of, of something put a present in your underwear. It's just embarrassing. Come on, <laughs> this is forty years ago. Uh, but you know what? I will say this in our, in our, on our behalf that there was a guy who 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 was hired by all of the. Um, um, all of the networks to come in and sweeten the, the, the audience response on the sitcoms. He had a little funny machine. His name was Charlie something or other. He had a strange little machine with a, with a painted black 
box with like a with a, like a, a, a lock on it, but you know, like from a garage door with a hasp and a, and a padlock. He opened it up, and there was something that looked a little bit like a cross between a typewriter and an Enigma machine, you know. And he would plug into the to the board. They'd play him the show, and he would sort of laugh. And as he laughed, he would he would put his responses in, a chuckle, you know, a groan, a laughter, an applause. And he would, it was an odd thing. I've seen, I saw him do it a couple of times. And he used to come to the Carson show to harvest the laughs. They allowed him, or his, you know, the, the audio guy, you know, was his friend or something. And he came to the, I remember a couple of saying, well, Charlie's here, he's, he's, getting, he's getting new material. So, so a lot of people were, were, on these sitcoms were laughing at jokes that I wrote. What was he like with writers? How what, what was Johnny? Like with writers? He was great. He was, mm -hmm. he was he was he was he was you know he's he was a little buttoned up you know, you know the way he used to walk. Huh? He's Nebraska you know Midwest, but um, he was he was I liked him a lot. He um, uh, he did fire us all once for playing frisbee in the parking lot, but then then he rehired us. Um, he I don't know he was. He let me run the he he let me run the staff pretty well, uh, left me alone. I hired and fired who who you know I needed to. Um, we'd have a meeting at his house, uh, at his apartment over at the UN Plaza every Monday for a while, and talk about sketches and and things like that. He was he was not as you know he's not a screamer or whatever, you know. He uh, I have no complaints. You you've talked about his. Um about political humor with him and about his uh, ability to decide when the time was right to do a joke. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't remember saying that, but I, but that sounds right. You know, he he was a little bit like the canary that you lower into the, you know, he he would he would say it's funny, but it's not no not not yet or something. And when he did the joke, it somehow certified the attitude and people. So I don't know whether he was reacting, whether he was a reactionary or whether he was leading. Uh, he had a wonderful arena instinct about that. And um, I mean, I, I, I can't uh, decode exactly what was going on in his mind because he never spoke about it. You went over to Cabot from Carson. I did. I, I defected. I mutinied. How did that come to pass? Well, Dick had this show on ABC, um, and he was an old and dear friend. And what, hap what would happen is that um, I, would, I would work, I would come to work, you know, at 9, 10 in the morning, work on the show for that night for Johnny, stay for the taping, which was 6.30 to 8 at that time, because we went on from 11.30 to 1 in those days. Then I would go home and I would watch Dick's show. And then at 12.30 or 1 in the morning, Dick would call, or I would call him, and we would talk about his show. And he, he, he was, at some point, I guess, that early on, he was insecure. He felt he wasn't being covered properly. He didn't, didn't like the, you know, there were a lot of things. And, and, and so I became a kind of a, an ad hoc um, um, counselor of some sort, or just somebody to kick ideas around with. And um, I was more emotionally invested in, in his show, as it turns out, than I was in the Carson show, which is sort of like, you know, the Queen Mary. It was there, it was, you know, it was coasting along. And then Dave Lloyd, who was Johnny's um, primary, wonderfully gifted, uh, brilliant comedy writer who did most of his monologue material. He left uh, to go over and be with Dick. There was something exciting about what Dick was doing. Um, you know, it, it, w it, was, it was a little bit more, the show was, as you, as you know, was a little more skewed toward, it, the, the assumptions that, that, that the show made about the audience were more interesting to us than the assumptions that The Tonight Show made about its audience without characterizing it any further. Dick was more interested in, you know, in literature and politics, and he was more in our wheelhouse. And um, Dave left, 
went over to work with Dick, and I f was like lonely and isolated, and I felt I'm, I was, you know, grinding out this stuff. And finally, I, I, um, I, and I also I was sort of very emotionally invested in, and I went to Johnny and I said, you know, I, you, you got to understand. I mean, uh, I've written my last Karnak saver. And he said, all right, good, if you, that's the way you feel. And uh, I actually broke the contract. I didn't even finish out the cycle. I was a different person. I, I, I had, a, had a different mm. view of things. I was not as stable as I perhaps I am now. Um, and that's how I left. And um, Dick was exciting. He wanted to do a whole show with one person that was radical, mm -hmm. you know, with Orson Welles or whoever it might be, or the Lunts. Or, um, and he had a bunch of young Turks working for him, you know, uh, for, uh, Jonathan Reynolds and, and um, uh, Bridget Potter and a bunch of very bright young people. And I felt like I was in an old age home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. And how long were you with Cabot? Let's see, 67 to 70 was the Carson show, 70 to 72, two and a half years. Uh -huh. And it was around toward the end of that that the whole deliverance thing happened, right? It was around no, that was 69. Oh it was, oh, it was earlier? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Because it came, the, 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 the movie came out in 69. I, uh, I was still on The Tonight Show, and I got a call from my, um, uh, from, uh, well, see, I was going to a, a, an analyst, uh, and he kept saying, you can't expect things to just fall out of the sky and make your life easy, you know? You, you, you have to stop the sense of entitlement that you have about what the world owes you. And the next day, I got a call from my accountant saying, I have a check on my desk from Warner Brothers for $180,000. What's going on? I said, I have no idea. And what had happened was that the record had, had broken. Wow. And that was one of the, yeah. So... It's important to be lucky, I guess. And only to that, I would only add that luck favors the prepared. Exactly. Have you had a number of different agents, or have you had? Um, um, Jack was a manager, mm -hmm. as distinct from an agent. Right. Sorry. Um, um, I have had three, but my agent of choice would be Sam Cohn, the legendary Sam Cohn. Uh, at ICM, who um, who really was 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 my uh, my, my conscience. Uh, he was just so he was your favorite the one who. Well, yeah, Sam was the last of. Uh, I mean, he Sam actually had some moral authority, mm -hmm. you know, and and, uh, and and Sam's world was included, but was not limited to the world of show business, which was uh, maybe you don't find that nowadays so much. And uh, he was a, you know, he, he, he's a great guy and uh, shall be missed. So you had said earlier that, that Jaffe was the one who, who sort of encouraged the collaboration. It was, yeah, it was Charlie. Mm. Yeah, so thanks to him. And uh, w when we, um, I mean, I would stand in the back of the bitter end and watch Woody do his act, his very early act, and marvel at, and of course it was, the, the audience was like they, they were looking at him like something had just moved in the wastebasket. I mean, they, they, they had no idea what to make of this guy. He was, he was doing jokes about his psychiatrist in 1966 or something, right? I mean, it was so shocking to hear somebody talk about the, that kind of intimate, you know, material. Um, he also did. I remember his, his act, his early act. He was still. You know, the, he was still letting the audience, under Jack's guidance, and that was Jack's genius, uh, tell Woody, the audience was telling him what, what he really was, what his persona was, what, what worked. So he'd try a whole lot of stuff, scattershot. He did what-if premises. The United States has accidentally um, launched uh, an ICBM and it's going to wipe out Moscow. And so uh, 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 Mayor Lindsay has to call Khrushchev. And so he did a little phone thing, you know, which is totally unlike what he would be mm -hmm. doing now. Mm -hmm. um, he did he did jokes about orgasm. He did jokes about his wife. He did um, strange stuff. But I would sit in the back and think, well, God, I've discovered it's like discovering, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, a novel that nobody knew Fitzgerald wrote. And 
so Charlie put us together, and it was all very formal, you know, because we were both kind of shy, a little bit, you know, uh, defended. Uh, and uh, we'd go to his house and we'd write jokes. And um, occasionally, you know, he had a couple of what they used to call specials, you know, like Monsanto right. or Libby's or 3M or whoever. You craft know. Music Hall. You did a Craft, craft Music Hall. Craft Music Hall with, with Candy him. Bergen. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, it was fun. It was great. And over the years, you know, we've, we've, we've stayed friends. I just took a walk with him yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we, we, you know, we did the same thing we did 40 years ago. We walked through the park and we talk about, you know, why business is no good and what's happening to film and girls. And, except now we're those guys that we used to point out in the park. Say, look at those two old guys, you know, I wonder what they're talking about. Well, it's us. How did the, the idea for Sleeper arise? We wanted to do a movie we wanted to do a silent movie. We wanted to do something audacious. Uh, Mel had done silent movie, but we thought we could we could do one too. Um, and we were very grand. We conceived of this as a two-parter with an intermission. Excuse me, like you know Exodus or you know something. The I longest mean, day. <laughs> yeah, you know, with an intermission and music. I mean. So the premise was um, a guy has a life now, contemporary life in 73, whatever it was, and then he um, gets a disease and he's frozen and then he's, he's rejuvenated uh, in the future. And the premise was that only... So, so you know, a, a week or so of conversation on that premise revealed to us something that we should have known immediately, which is that our strong suit was dialogue and ideas expressed in words, not, you know, just silent sketches and, and stuff like that. So we then decided that the, the, um, the premise was going to be that, that speech was, a, a, um, uh, was allowed only to certain uh, classes in the future, that it was a, I can't think of the word, but it was a... Totalitarian state. It was a totalitarian state. Uh, say, this is, yeah, speech, speech uh, was, was only uh, permitted uh, by people of the, you know, the higher class and that the, the underclass could not talk. And we threw that out also. And then we threw out the intermission. And um, we wound up with... Uh, the nice idea of, uh, of doing essentially a satire about contemporary life by putting it into the future. And it was very grand. I mean, we, we, had, we, had, we had wonderful ideas. We had a whole sequence when, when um, Woody goes into the future and they put him in a, in a machine that, that can visualize his dreams. And we had a long sequence that he, I believe he actually filmed in which he's a... Uh, a pawn in an enormous chess game with real people as the pawn, the king, the queen, the, the knights were actual guys on horseback. And he was a white pawn and there were a black, the black players. It was all filmed in a, the, the desert. And uh, at one point the, um, there's a black bishop with a, with a crucifix and he's going like that and he's looking at it. And, 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 the, and the, the, the voice of the player, which was God, was saying, um, maybe I should just sacrifice that pawn, you know. It was, it was quite funny. Um, all that stuff went out, you know. I don't know where it is. Hmm. But, um, so we started, you know, wanting to do the world and wound up with a, with a sweet little, little comedy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bad. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah. But I remember sitting in a movie theater in Washington and joke about Albert Shanker. Uh, got a hold of an atomic device, whatever it was. We didn't. He didn't like that. You know, he wrote us a letter. Yeah. Was how the, we should explain who Albert Shanker was. Well, you know, time. we didn't care. You yeah. know, th there were times when you just put in a joke for yourself or right. for your friends because it's like good luck or something. Yeah, it happens. But I remember because I remember because it was sort of like the New York part of the audience got the joke. Oh, sure. And, you know, I mean, nobody in Texas. Like, no, 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 absolutely not.
I guess I should ask you about the collaboration. How has that always been easy? Has it been difficult? Has it been? It's been a pleasure and a life changer. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, in a sense, I went to school with Woody. He was, mm -hmm. you know, like a couple of beats ahead of me, and I would watch him n navigate not only work you know, the work, which we can get into, but also, you know, dealing with the studios and 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 uh, how how to try and you know preserve what it is that you have that's special mm -hmm. and have confidence in it and 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 all that. But uh, it was a, it was very it was very easy. It was a I, you know, I, I'm older now, and I'm a little more settled and at peace about a lot of things. And I, I, I wish I could go back and start again with what I know now. I think I would would have uh, really understood what a, what a, um, life affirming, and changing experience it was working. Uh, in that kind of collaboration, you know, and how did how did we work? Mm -hmm. Conversation, dialogue. I mean, walks in the park. Uh, a di you know, a, a dialogue is a very good tool to explore ideas. You know, in fact, when I when I started out on my own to to um, to write, I would put a piece of paper in the typewriter, uh, and I'd type. A question and not answer it. I would try and do both parts. It was just a way of probably trying to, you know, to to uh, reproduce the uh, the idea of uh, of a dialogue. But that's really the thing. You know, we'd come up with a, you know, sleeper as an example. He he wanted to do, we wanted to do a silent movie. That's what started, and then you kind of explore it. Mm -hmm. And and it's really like a mystery, you know. You you, you you go down a certain path, you run into a brick wall, and you say, "This isn't going to work because they don't want that from us. They want some ideas, and there are certain things that we do that can only be expressed in words, unfortunately." So, I've already covered that, I guess. Um, it was easy in a sense that we were at that time writing for a known quantity, uh, uh, you know, his persona, which had been firmly established already from uh, his stand-up and the specials and stuff like that. So, you know, w we would never have considered writing a, a story about a southern sheriff in which he would play the southern sheriff, unless we, you know, I can't imagine why. But, you know, so we, you know, we, there were certain parameters. There, there was a frame, and he was uh, this, you know, overanalyzed, uh, self-conscious, uh, neurotic, uh, you know, Jewish guy who sort of was appealing and sexy because of the way his mind worked and all that. Um, and, and so starting from there, at least it's starting from somewhere. On Sleeper, he did the first, we, we didn't write scenes together. That's the death, I think, for any collaboration. See, I don't think there's any such thing, really, as an equal collaboration. I think that in any collaboration, one person, one personality, one point of view has to dominate. Otherwise, you wind up with a, with a you know, something with no, no legs or mm -hmm. no, no Sort of a half a lump. It's, exactly. You know. It's it's um, one person has to. I mean, because there are millions of decisions you make along the way. You you know you can talk about the structure. You can talk about what the scene is about and so on. But one person really should dominate. And I've had that now with other people. That now I'm I'm the one who has the you know the final say um, instinctually about how a scene should go or what people you know say during the scene. Um, so. Obviously, in the collaboration with Woody, he was the dominant um, part of the collaboration, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that I was um, n not a contributor and in fact, but when you come down, it finally comes down to writing the thing. First of all, he was writing for himself to say, you know, so he was the best choice to do that. Uh, but even if, it, if we were writing something for him not to be in, I think it's important for one person to kind of control it. because. There's always a little bit of therapy involved in writing. There's a little bit of I want my life up there. I gotta I gotta work something out in this, and you can't have two people working at cross purposes. You know, I once I once had a conversation with an actor who shall remain nameless. It was Richard Dreyfus, and um, uh, it was a script. It was a script, and uh, he um, he said, "Here's what had to happen. Here's what has to happen in this scene. I've got to I've got to pick up the suitcase, and." Uh, I've got to turn to her and say, I don't know about you, but I've got to get on with my life, and then I've got to go out and slam the door. 
and that'll be great. And I said, why? He said, because it happened to me. Well, and I said, Richard, I don't want to be in your movie. I want you to be in my movie. So the point is that his, his way might have been right, my way might have been right, but since I was the, the author, it turns out that my way was right by fiat. Um, so you can't have people fighting over sort of unconscious needs and agendas. Mm -hmm. So once he established the first draft, say, of the sleeper, were, it, it, to just go back and forth and yeah. back and forth pretty yeah. much? Yeah, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, yeah, on any hall, we wrote a, we, we had, um, it turns out that in the first draft we were kind of showing off, I don't know to whom, but it was, you know, we wanted to do a, 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 a film that had a kind of a literary feel to it uh, in which uh, you could jump around in time and you could have uh, something would remind somebody of something, you know, it had this kind of non-shape shape. shape. Mm -hmm. The first draft came out and there was no tension. I think the, the opening speech was, I'm turning 40, uh, I'm beginning to examine my life, uh, where did, how did I get to be who I am, why, what, what forces have shaped me, and so on and so forth. And I can't remember who it was, but we, we had a conversation. And one of us said, I think it was me, it's a story where I come out good, okay? I said, there, there's no tension in it. It's just a, like a conversation. And then he agreed, and then we talked about it before, and then the next draft contained a speech, opening speech, that was something like, well, I've just turned 40, and my girlfriend has left me for somebody who is the total opposite of what I am. So immediately you have a triangle. You have him, the girl, and the and the guy, it implies a whole lot of things. And that sort of focused the rest of the movie. So a simple little thing like that can take you, you know, on the right path and avoid a train wreck. That's why when, you know, people ask about, you know, what is it that makes something successful or not, you never know. It, you know, I mean, you've been there. So that's just an example of, uh, of, of the process, I guess. And that certainly Andy Hall, I mean, what, what you're saying in terms of ambition, you had all these different genres within the movie from animation to... Right, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, subtitles and yeah. split screens and all that. Was, how, many, how many million drafts? I mean, how many... How many you know? <laughs> there were uh, 10 million drafts. How many drafts? There were not that many. After the first glitch, um, you know, the first, first Annie, there was, which was called Annie Hall, and, and Annie Hall was not even a dominant character in the first draft. There were a lot of women, different wives. There was the one that ultimately became Carol. Kane was a wife, and one, you know, a, it was um, much different. Um, the, the girl, the dominant other, you know, part of the relationship, was a New York girl, just like Woody, um, in the first draft. And then the second draft, she was from Wisconsin, with a totally different background. So already, you know, you could see the development of some desire to to, to create uh, some potential for tension and, and disagreements and different backgrounds and so on. And then all that uh, eventually, you know, delivered the, the those scenes when he goes back to Wisconsin to to meet the family and their the, the, the grandma's anti-Semitic and the brother's crazy and Chris Walken and all that. That all came from that first kind of analysis of 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 what you need. You know, there are some rules that you really just can't break and 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 have it work. Apparently, mm -hmm. you know, you you do want you do want tension. There were two or three reshoots on the ending. I know that. There weren't mm -hmm. that many drafts. First draft was over, well over two hours. Uh, that was a real wake up call for me. Um, Woody went off, you know, they, they, they shot a shitload of stuff, um, put it together into a, a rough cut, and um, Woody screened it for me. It was like two hours and 40 minutes or something like that, and uh, I was devastated. I thought this is hopeless. 
this is a mess. This will never see the light of day. And because I hadn't any real experience with rough cuts and how much you can do by taking out and shaping and so on. And he was working with Ralph Rosenblum, was who, was, say, yeah. who was not chopped liver. I mean, mm -hmm. he, you know. And uh, I didn't say much because I felt like I didn't know enough to say anything. But, I, you know, you, you, uh, then they went and they started to work on it. And uh, they got it down, you know, to barely 90 minutes, you know. And that, that was the, that's the biggest lesson that I've, I think I've ever, ever learned in, in filmmaking is, is uh, how much you can do. Were you, were you surprised by the uh, reception? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. We had no idea what to think. There was a whole big thing about the title, you know. Woody wanted to call it anhedonia, not as a pun on Annie, but just as a you know the inability to express uh, right. or to feel pleasure. And they actually had a um, a campaign uh, worked out um, in which they would take ads in the newspapers that would say anhedonia hits Chicago, anhedonia hits, and then finally Arthur Krim said. You know, come on, please, <laughs> let us. And Woody picked Annie Hall. It seemed to work. This movie has been probably the, the it has more in, the most impact of any film that did nothing at the box office. I'm not not nothing, but you know, not a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's lasted. It's like a good New Yorker piece. You know, it keeps showing up, but <laughs> um, it was not a blockbuster. I didn't realize that. I didn't. I just. Uh, I know because you make assumptions that. You yeah. Know, but I, I don't. I, you know. It, it it didn't. It didn't earn a hundred million dollars. But that's okay. There's impact and there's impact. Right? That's right. We'll talk about the Oscar experience. You. You you went out. Yeah, I'm not crazy. I thought we had. A well, good, he didn't go out. He didn't go out because on Monday nights he played with the band. With Michaels. Yeah, but I, it, that's not the only reason, because I think he didn't, he thought it was bullshit. He thought that um, the Oscars are silly, and he didn't like competitive awards. And, um, but I, I, I thought, well, I was looking ahead. I thought it would be nice to be there if we won, you know. In your acceptance speech. I got a laugh. The hell did I say? Something about foreign film or something? Oh, yes, I thank the, uh, the Academy for giving uh, this award to a foreign film. <laughs> and they got it. They, they got it. And then Manhattan. Manhattan was a follow-up, uh, a much more conventional film, um, really. I mean, it's a straightforward romantic comedy. Uh, the only, the only eccentric thing about it is that Gordon Willis shot it in black and white, uh, and hard matted, the um, hard matted the, the the aspect so that for television, um, they they couldn't zoom in. He, he you know so there was a there was a bar. It was I don't think UA was very happy about that. Uh, it was a pretty film. It's a gorgeous um, film. And. Um, yeah, I mean, it, a, after Rainy Hall, it was like, it was easy, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know what it is. People like, like it, um, it's very conventional, isn't it? Well, I think it is, it, it is in one sense, and on, on the other hand, the relationships are, are, we're not as, I don't know, not, not the usual kind of relationships that I think most people were used to in a relationship. Well, the young comedy. girl yeah. is going out with the young girl, I guess. Um, and, and the whole, and the Diane Keaton character. Yes, the, the, the Susan Sontag yeah. type mm -hmm. person. Yeah, I guess the, the um, it, yeah, it was, it was a literate kind of film. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the Gershwin music and uh, those early shots are very pretty. Well, I was going to say, I think it's become, you know, a lot of people associated with that opening sequence and the, the Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue. And it just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's still what they, people remember, I think, a lot of, uh, about the film. But it's still a, a beautiful script, I think. Did you spend, did you, did, you, did you ever spend much time on the set? 
at all to mm -mm. Mm. no need mm -hmm. No, and I was off doing things, I don't know what I was doing, I was maybe, this was seven, this is uh, 1980, roughly. Yeah. So I was doing my own film at that point, I was, I think I was doing Simon. Were you doing Simon? Oh, that's yeah, right. That's right. What, what, uh, what made you want to direct? What? Doesn't everybody want to direct? Isn't there that great cartoon from the New Yorker where the guy is watching the, the seal blowing into the horns at the circus and he's saying what he really wants to do is direct? Why? Because it's a, it's a natural uh, uh, progression. You know, you, you, write, you write the thing, you want to you wanna control it a little bit more. Um, yeah, I had a chance to direct. I had a script. Luck favoring the prepared. I had a script ready to go, and, and um, you know, at that point it was Orion. Uh, they mm. said, sure. Being a screenwriter is a little like wanting to be a co-pilot. So, you know, you want to you wanna drive. You want to drive mm. it. There's a lot of things involved. There's ego. There's uh, therapy uh, to, get, you know, to get it exactly the way you hear it and see it. Um, so. You, um, I read a something that you said Stanley Donnan had told you about directing, about the, the fact that you said the basic techniques can be taught. In a week. In a, in a week, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He believes that, but I, you know, I, I wonder. That's, he's being very modest. I mean, things like screen direction and, you know, lenses, I guess. But I don't think, I don't, I, I, just not to contradict Stanley, but... I don't think there's one person that knows everything uh, uh, that you would need to know to actually make a movie. And that involves the writing, the casting, the directing, the cinematography, you know, the lighting, the chemistry involved, or now the electronics involved. So um, I think what you, what you need to do is have enough technique so that it doesn't impede your intuition, you know, so that you can... I mean that's what Stanley has. I mean he he, he would be the first to to say and uh, and and say it as a as an asset that he's not an intellectual that he's not thoughtful that he just feels it. You know he he, he knows when it's right. It has to do with movement. I mean his background as a as a dancer. Dancer. I don't. You know if 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 I knew that if he knew it then then you could teach it assuming that it could be learned. Um, I don't know, there are just certain things that he did, and I don't know, I've asked him about it. I said, you know, that, that shot in Singing in the Rain, there's a crane shot that brings tears to your eyes. finds him down, that the, comes in on the, the yeah. tight, yeah. the close-up, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea why, why, why it works. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, it's, it's un, it's un, some of it is unknowable. And, um, and that's why you want to direct, you want to, you want to find those moments. It's yeah. interesting too, though that he he worked with some great writers. I mean, Condon and Green, Freddie Raphael. Yeah, know, he did. You know, uh, um, he's uh, Stanley is very he, he knows where to go, mm -hmm. and he makes those people feel that they can talk to him. He can speak their language, you know, which isn't always the case. So that's why you want to direct. And how did the where did the the notion of Simon come from? It came from the, the one level of unconscious that, you know, something pops up. What if a think tank wants to see what would happen to the society if, a, if a, um, an alien were to suddenly appear? It's really just an excuse to do a satire about, you know, contemporary life. Um, you know, I don't know where the idea comes from, but I know how it develops. And I, I, I'm a big fan of Bach. I'm, I was a music major, and I play, and, and um, he's always fascinated me. And one of the things that I learned early on about the way he worked, Johann Sebastian Bach, is that he would go up to his, his little writing room with a little brandy after all the kids were asleep, and he'd have, he'd have to write a cantata for that Sunday and it was now Thursday. And he, um, 
he would uh, have a, a desk about the size of a ping pong table, a little bit smaller, and he would lay out all of the music, the blank music with the staves printed on it. And he knew that he had a, a, a chorale that he wanted to use as the basis of the, of the cantata, that, that you know, week would be this, this chorale. So he would write the chorale over here, and then he would take that and he would say, well, I need an introduction. So he'd try and take a motif and he'd start to write the introduction over here. And then he would have an idea that over here there should be an art. So he had an eagle's eye view of the whole thing. Um, and he would be able to see the thing not in a linear fashion, which is one of the problems with computers, or actually anything where you turn pages is all in a, you know, it's on a scroll in a sense. But if you're doing a work that exists in time, it's nice to, to have a, uh, a, a be able to look at the thing as a piece of architecture. And somehow from that I extrapolated uh, that that's the way, and for many years that's the way I worked. I would get a big piece of paper, actually it was the kind of paper that they use in sound mixes, you know, they're about this big, you know, 24 by 20 by 30 or something like that. And I'd start with the idea and that would make me think of something and I'd make an arrow and that would come around here and gradually you build up a story and it's not exactly linear and then, but it, 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 it gives you a chance to be very, very fluid. They try to, to design programs I see now like Movie Magic and some of these things to, to, to emulate that kind of thing but you can never do it on a computer because a computer is essentially something on an endless scroll. What you need is to work like a graphic artist and, and to balance and draw lines between things. This person is married to this person but likes this person and this person does this job over here that might lead him to do this thing and I'm overstating this. I did that for a long time. I don't do that much anymore because I can do a lot of that in my head now. Mm -hmm. But it's, I've never seen that a technique uh, I mean, I know that people do things on cards, and right. that's kind of a similar thing, mm -hmm. you know, to do it on cards. But the cards, you can't connect them exactly. I, right. I, and you're you're charting. The yeah. Structure. Yeah. You're evolving. It's like, it, 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 since it's like a like an abstract painter who says, "I need something over here," and then, but you know, and it balances. And I don't know. I might be crazy. Yeah. Well, speaking of evolving, I'm thinking of the sequence in the film when Arkin. Evolves. Oh, yeah. I just told him one thing. I said, I want you to evolve from a one-celled animal and go through all of the stages uh, of, of life. And he said, oh, all right. And then he went away and he came back and he, he said, he did this, he said, and I said, okay, that's brilliant, that's great. And then we did a close-up of him and he went like that. That was all Alan. That's uh -huh. all Alan. He was a genius, and well, except for the part where you did the the chart. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, the that was freeze frame. Mm -hmm. It's very crude, but it's it worked though. Yeah, it worked great. Yeah, they want to remake it. Somebody told me they want to remake really? it. Simon, yeah, wouldn't that be fun? Now, now that I know how to make a movie, you know, the first movie you make, you think they'll never let you make another one, so you want to put everything you ever thought of into right. the movie. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, Citizen Kane versus Magnificent Amberson. Yes, you know. exactly, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was a good cast. It had, I mean, some interesting people. Madeline Kahn and Allen and, and uh, Austin Pendleton, um, Judy Grobart. Uh, oh, Judy Grobart, my God. Yeah. Electric Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A strange little movie. I was a, a pathological fan of, of, uh, of Jim Henson. Um, when he did his little Sullivan appearances, Glowworm, I don't know if you remember that. Absolutely. Yeah. He was great. And we had a mutual friend, uh, and uh, he introduced me to his people. And then they got a deal, um, Henson and uh, Jane, to do a pilot for ABC. And he asked me to write it. And uh, I wrote it. I called it Sex and Violence with the Muppets. And everybody, the, 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 uh, the, the networks, the network hated it and all the other ones hated it. So his lawyer, whoever it was, took it over to England where Lou Grade bought it and, and the rest is uh, you know, history and economics. And um, 
I was so thrilled to be working with Jim. Um, this is a thing that was uh, ultimately syndicated in like 80 countries or something like that. Yeah. And, it was, and I, w I, was, I was thrilled and happy to get my $7,500 and, and a buyout. <laughs> he was really a genius. And um, we, we did one thing. Uh, we did a show with, uh, he did a show with uh, Julie Andrews uh, that was shot over in London. Um, and uh, Blake Edwards uh, directed it. And um, we went over and we did this, this TV special where he did some Muppet stuff and then he did some very large, uh, she did a dance with like some six foot tall creatures, you mm -hmm. know, and he, he, we talked about a, a Broadway show, he and I. Really? Uh, yeah. He wanted to do, he wanted to do Broadway and uh, it would have been great. You know, he had a couple of ideas. A lot of the stuff that we did for the Muppet, for the Sex and Violence show still um, you know, lives on like the the, uh, the two old guys in the in the, the, the Waldorf, Stetler and Waldorf, Stetler Waldorf. And, Waldorf and the Swedish chef. Somewhere I have a tape of me in doing Swedish so that he could imitate it. <laughs> Not that he needed it, but I he asked for it. Lovesick I wrote. Um, my analyst at that time claimed, I think wrongly, that it was a little Valentine to him, which I disagree. Um, it was just a, an, it seemed like a natural idea. Nobody had ever done it, you know, because it ha actually I had known that um, Elaine May um, was married to David Rubenfein, who was the head of the New York Psychoanalytic Institute and was an analyst and of, of his. And, um, he fell for her while they were in treatment, and uh, he left his wife. And um, I thought, well, there's a movie, you know. Um, Just as Manhattan was uh, was was an idea that that I that I got really from a John McPhee uh, a book called The Curve of Binding Energy about uh, the development of the of the bomb and Ted Taylor and the guys who. Um, miniaturize the bomb. But anyway, so this was a, a simple uh, little romantic comedy and um, Peter Falk was going to do it and then he didn't do it uh, and Dudley stepped in and uh, it was, I'm not sure what, you know, it's a nice little movie. Elizabeth McGovern. Oh, yummy. Mm -hmm. Everybody was in love with Liz. Right. And Alan Guinness, what was that? I sent the script to Guinness, and um, they said, um, his person said, um, here's the number, and call Sir Alec at exactly 6 o'clock. And don't call him at 10 after 6, and don't call him at 5.30, and call him. As it turns out, the day that I was going to call him was the day that they change over from their equivalent in London of daylight saving to, and I could not figure out and they could nobody could tell me on any side of the Atlantic what when I was supposed to call because you know we don't change our day our, our daylight saving time at this on the same day that England does right that it's different or something and I and the operators couldn't tell me so naturally I called him at the wrong time uh, I called him at a hotel he was at somewhere in London and there was a long wait and I said uh, sir Alec it's the wrong time right he said, yes, I, you've just got me out of my bath. And I said, well, so do, do we have anything to talk about? He said, I love the script. I'd like to do it. I'll do it on one condition. He said, my memory is not what it was. He says, please don't change anything. I said, it's a deal. And I said, I want you to do me a favor. I said, I'm going to send you a photograph of Freud, which is a famous portrait that someone took of him holding a cigar mm. and I said I want you to duplicate it you know go to the or, you know go to Doug Hayward or whoever it is you go to and get the suit made and get the cigar and go and he did a beautiful job somewhere I have the photograph and mm -hmm. it's on the it's on the wall in Dudley's office in the movie hmm. and people think it's a Freud he looks exactly like Freud. I know the picture you mean yeah. Exactly and it's but the difference is that the that that in the original the Cigar is absolutely parallel to the frame, and in and, and, and Alex it's like that. Anyway, um, 
and he came and he did it and he was great and he drove Dudley crazy because Dudley is an improviser and he's a counterpuncher and he likes to play and everything and Alec would not change a thing and he was very clever you it was almost impossible to cut out of Alex's takes Alex's because he would he would produce a bunch of moves where, where he was talking and um, he just made sure that he you know he finished his he, it was very difficult he was very clever he would always ask you know where are you cutting where are you cutting um, hmm. but he was great he was good a good awesome. spirit I was remembering and, Cavett was the one I heard it from I don't know if it was original with Dick but that the anagram for Alec Guinness is genuine class that and Dick will do that. Yeah. And he'll keep doing it until you stop yes. him. Yes, yes. But, but I think of Guinness yeah. being that indeed. Oh, yeah. I mean, just yeah. a class, class act. John Huston was in that movie. Mm -hmm. He played Dudley's analyst. I remember, I remember sitting with, um, with, with Houston. Uh, they were setting up and um, he, he, he said, no, I, I did a movie uh, about psychoanalysis. I said, Yes, I know. It was called Freud. I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "Did you? Were you ever in, you know, in treatment or anything?" I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "I said." He said, "Why?" I said, "Well, I had a little trouble flying. I didn't like to fly." He said, "Yeah, same thing happened to me." He said, and then he told me that he was shooting footage over Palermo during during the war. You know, he was in the, the information thing, and they got shot down, and they were floating in the ocean. He said, you know, and, and after that, he said, it could, took me a couple of days before I could go up on a plane again. You know, and I didn't like to get on the shuttle to Boston, and I'm talking to this guy who's, you know, <laughs> shot down over Palermo. Anyway. Well, the battle for, uh, what was the film he did? The battle? Yeah. Uh, San Pietro. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether he was just giving me one of these or whether he was just being friendly. I was think it intimidating? Was it intimidating working, no. directing him? Because no, no, he was he was fine. He just did it, you know, for the. I wasn't. I I don't get intimidated by that. I get intimidated by my own feeling of of, of insecurity, but not because somebody else is there. And then uh, I sort of think of the Manhattan Project coming out of your suspension from the University of Wisconsin. For thinking they were <laughs> about U.S. bases. Well, I wanted. I mean, you know, there was something about that movie that tries to touch on mutually assured destruction. I wanted to reduce it to a little tiny personal interchange because the kid has the bomb. I'm a bit of a science geek, and and uh, I read. Um, I read the McPhee piece. Right, Curve of Binding Energy. Curve of Binding Energy, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I also, I don't know whether this anecdote was in it, but um, uh, Freeman Dyson uh, was teaching at Princeton. He was teaching a, a nuclear proliferation course, uh, and um, one of the assignments was to see how close you could come to designing a device with uh, materials that were available in, in the public domain and, you know, from various sources, you know, the different la laboratories, uh, the government labs. And this guy named John Phillips turned in a term paper which, which, which uh, Freeman Dyson uh, immediately sent to the FBI and said, this kid has pretty well done it, so you better be careful. And I read that and I thought, oh, well that's a movie, you know. Uh, of course, I put the kid in high school. Uh, rather than in college, but this, it's, a, it's a true story that, um, you know, under Operation Plowshare, uh, Eisenhower uh, declassified a whole lot of uh, atomic information to prove that we're not trying to dominate the world and, you know, when, when uh, after the war. So a lot of that stuff was, was declassified and a lot of, a lot of hard work uh, that was done, you know, at Los Alamos and, and the other uh, the labs uh, became generally available. And this kid found it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bran Farron, who designed the set, 
another genius friend of mine who now has a company, he used to work at Disney as their technology guy, he designed this amazing set that he then heard from people in the nuclear community saying, where is that lab? We've, we, we're unaware of that lab. So it was so convincing. Yeah, I think you, you were saying something about uh, Los Alamos uh, garage sales or something that they sold. You know, yeah, the, the, you know. the, the scientists there at Los Alamos would um, uh, you know, have experiments that required these multi-million dollar cracking towers and things, stainless steel, uh, and then the experiment would be done or it would go awry or something and they'd, they'd, and they'd sell it off at a dollar a pound. So he went out, Brand went out with like four uh, tractor trailers and he just bought like $200,000 worth of shit and then put, put it all together. And Amazing. Yeah, it was, it was fun. So that was sort of the, the grandest scale film that you did in yeah. terms of that, in terms of that uh, yeah. logistically. Yeah, that big yeah. set it was nice. Uh -huh. You did Sister Mary Explains It All as a director. Mm -hmm. How was that dealing with someone else's work? You were working with Chris Durang. Yeah, it was fine. I, mm -hmm. I did a revision and uh, he was fine. He signed off on it because they are two different media. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, Keaton did it, uh, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a quirky little piece, you know. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's, I thought she was wonderful. We had a nice cast. We had a good time. There's something about um, putting at the center of a, of, a, of a piece a crazy person. You know, it's hard. There's no way in, really. So mm -hmm. it, it, you, you know, it, you're, you're at some remove. It's hard to identify, you know, with with somebody who's out of her mind. And you know, the other characters. You know, there's not enough time really to develop it. So, um, I think it probably was more effective as a play, where you can be more fanciful, than a, a, as a film, which which is more documentary, and you know wants a certain kind of intimacy. You added a, a subplot, seems to me. There was the drive, the getting getting to the reunion. Well, I, you know, I was trapped in a room. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got <laughs> no, it was interesting. I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. How you came to that? Just to, to want to give it some air and, mm -hmm. and some development, because otherwise you're just filming the play, mm -hmm. you know. And Chris mm -hmm. was fine with that, yeah. There's, there's going to be a film of Jersey Boys I was about to, yeah. And, um, um, you know, that's also going to be interesting because, you know, we'll have the opportunity to really open it up and uh, see things that you can only allude to on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on the stage. Have you started working on that? Or? No. Mm -hmm. But it's been, it's, it's a go. It's, it's in my head, yeah. some of it. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how, yeah. you, how you choose to do that. In 93, you went back to Woody Allen. You collaborated again oh, with Woody Allen, uh, Manhattan Murder Mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By that point, you'd done a lot of directing yourself. Was it was it easy enough to go back into the? Yeah, because I love Woody, and yeah. and it's it's just you know it's fun. I I did a draft uh, on an idea that he had had, and then he took it and he um, he changed it. It 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 was a very quick thing I was, I was um, it was uh, this idea you know of the of the, the couple next door the, the, the stuff and and actually it was an idea that had been in his mind for a long time hmm. and um, I guess we kind of wanted to get together again um, uh, not much to say about it I, I, I had very little to, to, to do with that other than doing the first draft mm -hmm. and then he took it you know and uh, there's nobody more redundant uh, on the set than uh, the co-writer when Woody Allen's the writer and the director, you know, I, so I, didn't, I have nothing wonderful about, about that. You did a couple of movies with Mark Rydell. Yeah, Intersection. And For the Boys. And For the Boys, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the, yeah, that, that was a very big, uh, the Intersection was of course a, a Claude a Sauté, uh, a mm -hmm. French movie, mm -hmm. um, that uh, Sherry Lansing, uh, who was at uh, Paramount at that time, it was a big fan of that movie and um, so I did a, a, essentially an adaptation of the, 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 the Sauté movie. Was it Gear? Yeah. Was it Gere, Richard Gear and, and Sharon Stone and 
can't remember who the other girl was. Lolita Davidovich. Very good. The interesting one was uh, was for the boys because it was Bet, and um, uh, that was a big that was a, a big canvas. Three wars. Right. Uh, I think she got a, an Academy Award nomination. I believe so. Bet, yeah. yeah. Or an Academy Award, maybe. But it's sort of the Martha Ray, Bob Hope. Although I would deny that. Yeah. In fact, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's about that. Um, I don't know how well the movie did. Um, it had a kind of a checkered history. There was a there was an earlier set of writers on it, I believe, and one of the authors had some horrible accident where he became immobile or something. He became a oh. quadriplegic uh, or a paraplegic, um, and then. Uh, I had I had worked with Mark on another film that wasn't done. It was a novel uh, of, by Avery Corman called Fifty, about a, a guy who's reaching fifty, a sports writer, and mm -hmm. has a life crisis and family problems and all that. And uh, I was going to be Richard Dreyfuss. That's the that, oh, that that's was, the Richard Dreyfuss. That's the story. Richard Dreyfuss anecdote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, great cast: Keaton and Richard Dreyfuss and um, um, uh, Rob Reiner and. Uh, Anyway, really good, but uh, it was um, not to be. Uh, and so we, uh, Mark and I knew each other, and he asked me to do this, and then uh, we did for the boys. And again, I, I went out to California once to see them shooting the Vietnam s sequence, which right. was just north of north of LA. They have, you know, canyons that look a yeah. little bit like you've been. Yeah. And um, one thing that I that I do remember, uh, it's. Um, Sort of a classic image. Um, Bet was um, <laughs> Bet was waiting for the camera to be set up, and I was there, and she did that, and somebody put a lit cigarette in it. And she took a <laughs> puff, and I thought, she's really a star. Boy, that's great. That is so cool. And but James Con was in. James Con was in it as a, as a, as Bob Hope. Yeah. And what was it like working with Rydell? Was was that a Mark? I like Mark. Mm -hmm. He was. Um, I I had inherited Mark from um, his one-time partner Sidney Pollack, who was originally going to do um, Fifty. Mm-hmm. And then he went off to do something else, and he gave it to Mark. Because he had done Kramer versus Kramer. No, that was. No, never mind. No, no. Mm -hmm. um, fifty. He was going to do fifty, and then Mark. Yeah. Anyway, um, Mark. Mark was a. Uh, he was, you know, he's he's um, very talented. He's a wonderful actor. I don't know if you've ever seen that Altman film, uh, where he plays a guy named Johnny Augustine. He plays a, a heavy. I can't think of the name of it. Great, and um, Is that long goodbye. Might be. Yeah, it mm -hmm. might be. He he smacks a girl across the face with a coke bottle. Yeah, it's long goodbye. Is that the long yeah. goodbye? Yeah. Um, I, I had fun with Mark. He's a jazz. You know, he loves to play jazz piano. He's um, he's a, a very much an actor's director. You know, he's he's on the bored at the studio and he's he's always talking to them about you know lubricating themselves and and uh, you know making adjustments you know stuff that I that I, I don't understand about that stuff I just want to hire the right people and let, let them do but he's very into the into the whole mystique and the craft of acting and he gets good performances out of people and he got a great performance out of bet for uh, for the for the rose who are the screenwriters you've admired who are the ones that you've Um, oh, lists. Dudley Nichols, mm -hmm. Woody, Goldman. I'm going to leave people out. Um, Mankiewicz, both brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, Preston Sturgis. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm thinking sort of comedy. I think uh, The Lady Eve is one of the great scripts right. ever. 
trying to think if there's anybody now. You know who's a good screenwriter is uh, Richard Laguavanese. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and um, uh, what's his name? Um, from from Baltimore. Barry Levinson. Barry Levinson yeah. mm-hmm. is a really wonderful screenwriter. Mm-hmm. It's hard to know who contributes what to whom, you know, unless you really you fly on the wall, whether it's the director or whether. Aaron Sorkin did, did a hell of a job on, on, uh, on that movie. Uh, although I, <laughs> maybe it's exactly what he intended, but I didn't really like anybody in the movie, finally. Who were your mentors? I don't have too many. Woody, obviously, is a kind of mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my, my mentors were that, that little um, bleachers of people that sit in the back of your mind, you know, that are made up of, you know, living and dead and, and people from different centuries and, and um, that, that sort of filter your ideas you know, and, and give you back a little, a little, you know, a little feedback about, do you really want to do that joke? Do you want to do that idea? Do you want to do that? So, you know, I, I didn't go to school with anybody. I never studied writing. I never studied filmmaking. But whatever it is that I am is the sum total of everything that I've read, seen, experienced. And it sounds a little tree huggy, but you know, um, I, I did like 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 many of us actually. There's something about Woody that is very confident and and um, um, uh, focused. You know, and there was a period in my life when I was working with him the first time where uh, it was almost like I was wearing one of these these bands where you know the kids they wear WWJD. You know. What would Jesus do? I would, I would, re- I would wear one that would say WWWD, and um, it wasn't a bad thing to try and put myself in his shoes because he was a couple of, as I said, a couple of steps ahead of me and watch him um, do that. He once said something which I think had a, a, a kind of a re- reverse effect. He said, "You know, if you act like an artist, they'll treat you like an artist." Now that sounds good until you realize that sometimes they don't like artists. You know, so <laughs> you act like an artist. They're not going to give you everything you want and worship you. If you're like an artist, they'll say, "No, screw it. You're not going to get that much money and cut that." You know, so, but it's an interesting mantra, kind of. Um, you know, I, I'm a great reader of biography. I love biographies, and I love biographies of creative people. I like to read whoever you know, whether it's Bach or or Orson Welles or 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 Elia Kazan or you know or. Cellini or whoever the hell it is. And he, what I like to extract from biography is work process and how they deal with problems and how they, and, and, and in a sense, those are, those are mentoring uh, entities, I think, also, even though they're not present in the room. You, you talk about charting out story structure and so forth. Are there other, you just mentioned process, are there, are there other things about your process that are consistent? <laughs> I tend to think arbitrarily uh, in film uh, in a three-act structure, even though it's not really a three-act structure, because you've got to start somewhere. Uh, the first act can be one page, you know, or it can be 30 pages. Um, um, I like to know where I'm going. Uh, I like to think, well, here's, a, here's something that I, that I do. When people come, sometimes people will bring up an idea and they'll say, you know, I'd like to I have a great idea. I want to do. I want to do a movie or a story about the Civil War or about Watergate or about whatever. And I always think to myself and sometimes say, "Why don't you tell me the story in terms of a relationship?" And if you can do that, then you have the beginning of something that's dramatic and that will have human interest. If you can tell me you want to do a story about a particular guy who lives on the east side, who's a comedy writer and, 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 and you know, uh, wants to figure out his life, don't do it that way, but say to me, I want to do a story about a guy who's been going out with a girl and suddenly she, she leaves him for somebody who stands for everything that he hates. And, and I think almost every good story can be reduced to that little paradigm. 
tell me the story in terms of a relationship, ideally with at least three people in it. Can you teach it? Can you teach that? Or can you yeah, I just did. Yeah. I don't know if you can learn it, but you, you can try and teach it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a way because you know whatever works. Uh, what do you? I mean, you you were talking about some of the script writing programs for and so forth. I mean, and I think the the, the word is orthodoxy on the on the on the twenty questions list, but the Robert McKees and the the, the courses. And, um, and, again, I think. I'm not that familiar with the McKee. I once saw the book. I didn't buy it. I think I read it at, at, at Borders or something. Or, yeah, I flipped through it because uh, I have my own ego and all that. But it seems to me that what he's doing is the equivalent of teaching somebody who wants to be an artist the rules of perspective, you know, and, and, and maybe a little more than that. Mm -hmm. And you can teach somebody the rules of perspective. It's gonna, not going to turn them into a Picasso, you know. Um, it's, so I think on that sort of primitive level, there's nothing wrong with 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 knowing about things like uh, uh, you know symmetry and and paying things off and conflict and resolution and you know arcs a little bit. Um, it'll give you a kind of vocabulary and a way of thinking about the material. It's not going to turn you into you know. Uh, it, it can make you a journeyman writer, you know. It, it, those things can easily be taught. What can't be taught is how you take those things and then you, you throw them away and you break through into something else because there's a whole other area that can't be taught and that's what you think about the world and who you are and what you think is funny and what you hate and what you don't hate. And, and, and also to have the technique to be able to actually clearly communicate that. Um, Nothing wrong with that stuff. It, it's it's functional, serviceable for the majority of people who want to be in, in in the field. You know. You talk about three act structure before. How did you make the transition to theater? How did that take place? Well, I did have to be reminded um, that you can't cut to anything when you're on stage because you're there, and it's like dealing with stones. Um, again, there are certain. How did I make the transition? Uh, a little, with a little bit of pain, a little bit of pain. Uh, I ultimately uh, embraced the the uh, the constriction of theater, the mm -hmm. requirements of you know how to get people on and off stage. Something that never comes up in the movie, <laughs> right? Um, especially in a musical where where there's you know there's 19 things going on and, and they all have to mesh. In fact, watching a musical, watching the musical from backstage and seeing what has to happen is is probably the most complicated thing in the universe you know next to the human brain so much has to happen and it has to happen like that and it's live you know so that's my good word about theater um, but they, you know film and theater are really different you know there there's there are of course some similarities you know it's like there are some rules like in life you know there's Newtonian physics, you know, an object will move in a certain way if you throw it and, and there are forces and so on and so forth and that can be applied to many different sports just as, as the rules of drama can be applied in a general way to movies or to theater but, but very quickly uh, the, the, the t two things diverge in terms of how you create your effects, I think. I was thinking about Woody Allen, uh, not Woody Allen, I was thinking about Larry Gelbart's line about it, if Hitler's alive, I hope he's out of town with a musical. Yeah. Um, it's I didn't have that. Well, actually, on, on uh, Adam's Family, we uh, I, I thought of, uh, uh, actually, I, ca I called him and I said, you know that thing that you said? Well, it's happening. Every cre complicated creative enterprise, whether it's a film or a, or, or a theater, he brings together uh, people with a lot of healthy egos and there's a lot, there's sometimes friction. Um, in the absence of a really strong leader, the friction can become destructive. Uh, if there is a strong leader, then it becomes productive, mm -hmm. and you just have to get lucky. You were talking before about taking a walk with Woody Allen just mm -hmm. yesterday, and talking yeah. about the business. How has it changed? How has the movie business changed? Oh, in so many ways. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there was a golden age of film, it probably had a lot to do with the fact that the people who were writing the films came out of a, um, more literate media. They came out of uh, 
uh, journalism, um, a lot of the great writers of films of the 30s and 40s were, you know, like you know Ben Hecht and mm -hmm. uh, were, were um, people who had some real life experience uh, and and uh, and and were uh, were literate. And um, now, um, you know, television has kind of uh, neutered that to some extent. So so the, the, that's one thing. It's it's like many things. The the the, the emergence of the world market you know, has put a great strain on culturally specific kind of material like comedy. You know, uh, action films, of course, do much better than other kinds of films because they can, you don't have to understand anything when you're watching a car blow, blowing up. Um, they become more expensive. Um, on, the, on the positive side, the, the emergence of, of, of this light and inexpensive equipment is a miracle. I mean, this camera here that that um, that John is using uh, is something that you could shoot a feature on, and it would look as good as anything that was ever shot, you know, with, with a Panavision, you know, with the best lenses and all that. So uh, it's it's really um, because it's uh, what the, the technology is sort of democratizing um, the production aspect of it. And now what we need is people who can reach back into the literary history uh, uh, and, and, um, and, and produce. It, but it's true, you know, the art always is, lags behind the technology. It happened when movies first started, you know, it was sufficient to watch a freight train, you know, come toward you. Uh, and eventually, you know, you, you had uh, some, some worthwhile stuff. So. Now, because of, of the, the equipment, because of CGI, because now nothing really limits your imagination, you know. Uh, and editing too. I mean, and editing too. It's all very, it's very exciting, and it's all going to shake out. You know, I mean, you know, the, the film in terms of chemistry is going to be gone. Um, you can shoot a film on a on a camera that costs. I think there's a Nikon or a Minolta or something where you can shoot a film. On a thing that looks like a <laughs> like a snapshot, and and uh, edit it on your on your computer. Mm -hmm. um, so you know there've been massive changes in the in the in the technology and in the distribution. Um, what hasn't changed is the need for s good stories, for narratives, and I don't know where that's going to come from. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Talk about your theory. You have a th I read your theory of comedy is a sort of corrective. That's not mine. That's Henri Bergson, ah. <laughs> who uh, who wrote a book on laughter. Mm -hmm. On laughter, I think. Um, I don't. I don't know that it's my theory, or even that it is a theory. But but um, you know, there's all kinds of laughs. There's laughs, and then there's jokes. And I think that that the joke is a subcategory of the laugh. You know. Um, there are some jokes that are standalone and don't need any explanation. And then there are laughs where, if taken out of context, they're meaning they're meaningless. Um, an example of a joke that doesn't need anything is a joke where a horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, "Why the long face?" Okay, so. That it just it doesn't mean anything. It's just a silly joke. Then there's a joke at the end of Annie Hall, which is 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 more has more insight. It's the one about the, the I don't remember how it goes exactly, but it, the, the 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 guy says, you know, it's the the wife says to her friend, it's my husband. You know, he's 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 crazy. He thinks he's a chicken. He he runs around scratching at the ground and and clucking. And she says, so so you know, get him some therapy. And she says, I I would, but we need the eggs. So that's more than a joke because it has a little bit of insight about the nature of relationships and how there's a certain amount of denial that's necessary in all in, in all relationships um, so you know it's hard to nail a particular kind of thing yes it can be a corrective I mean any any satire is to some extent a, a, a corrective there's a book called English usage by a guy named Fowler. It was first published around the turn of the century, but there have been subsequent editions of it. And in it, uh, under the category of humor, he has a grid that describes different types of humor, like um, 
satire, lampoon, whatever it is. And then the subject and the technique and the target and the effect. And it clears up once and for all exactly what it is that we're all doing. I'll leave it there. I read another an article where you talked about a twofold philosophy of life. Which the first part was always do the opposite of what your father <laughs> suggested. Right, it still holds. And the second was to work with people you look forward to having lunch with. I think those are eminently uh, useful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because lo lots of good things happen at lunch. When people come and ask me what advice I might give them, young people, to get into the business, I remind them that we have far too many people in the business already and that what we really need is people in health care. But seriously, don't, have, don't just read about, if you want to do films, don't just watch movies and read scripts, but acquaint yourself with everybody from Sophocles all the way up to David Sedaris. I think that's the smartest thing you can do, and walk to dry land on their ashes. One thing to keep in mind is, uh, um, I'm not sure whether it's from the King James Bible, it's from somewhere, it's, it, it's a statement, it says, this too shall pass. And that works for everything, the good and the bad. <laughs>